Good morning. We're going to get started in like three or four minutes because it's 8 a.m. So <laughs> I know that people are still getting their coffee. But thank you so much for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so, so much for being here. I know it's early, woo, and I just dropped my phone. Um, really, really happy you're here with us today. Um, so my name is Carolina Mikowski. I will be chairing this session, um, and I am currently the Career Development and Mentorship Manager of the Student and Postdoc Special Interest Group, or SP SIG for short. Um, some of you guys may already be familiar with our committee. Um, these are all of our beautiful faces. Uh, so the SP SIG has put on quite a few events this week. This is our last of four. Um, we started with our, um, uh, we had our social event, um, 
Monday night, I'm getting all days confused, Monday night um, we had a lunch with mentor session, perhaps some of you were there. Um, yesterday we had a round table event and today we're here um, with our annual symposium um, trying to help uh, give some tips and guidance for career development and mentorship. Um, we do have a turnover every year, so if you um, liked these events, um, and if you're interested in com um, contributing to the OHBM trainee community, um, follow us on Twitter, OHBM underscore trainees, and you will um, see at some points we'll put out a call for applications for all of these positions that you see on the slide. So we've got our chair um, position currently held by Anne Bio, um, secretary Philip Morris, treasurer Leo, social coordinator Isabella, uh, Raul, the social media and communication manager, blog editors, uh, Marianne and Lisa and me, and then all of our elects at the bottom as well. Um, so yes. Thank you for supporting our events, really appreciate it. Um, so today, we have three um, wonderful speakers. Um, one of them cannot be with us in person today, um, but uh, let me just go through what the topic of today is. So we are here to re-envision the future of academic training. Um, so we have three maybe seemingly independent topics, but the idea is we are um, obviously growing as a community, um, we are aware of so many important, important issues like equity and diversity in research, um, what can we do with a PhD, what are other alternatives out there, or what um, skill sets should we be highlighting from our graduate studies, as well as, especially I think the pandemic has taught us well, is that we need to take care of our health, both physical and mental, um, so we're also going through work-life balance. So. Um, Dr. Maria Natasha Raja will be speaking about work-life balance first. She's a professor at McGill University. Um, she is here in person, but she will be, um, we're just going to be playing her pre-recording. Um, and then Dr. Inger Mooburn is a professor at the Australian National University, um, and she's also known as the thesis whisperer. So she's going to be speaking about what, how you can translate PhD skills um, into the workforce depending on where you want to go. Um, so we'll play that recording as well. And then we have Victory Kuda, who's a medical student at University of California, San Diego, um, who's here with us today, um, and will be speaking about um, equity and diversity in STEM research. So um, the talks are shorter, they're like 15 minutes each, and I really wanna give enough time for you guys to have a really nice Q&A with Dr. Raja and Mr. Ikuda. Um, and with that, uh, we can go ahead and play Dr. Raja's recording. Thank you so much again for being here. Hi, I'm Dr. Natasha Raja, full professor and assistant dean of career development at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill University, located in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Thank you to the organizers of this symposium, re-envisioning the future of academic training, Drs. Carolina Mikowski and Cynthia Lobopin, for inviting me to participate. Today, I've been asked to speak to you about navigating academia in a pandemic era. The pandemic has impacted everyone's daily routine, both in terms of work and personal goals. The long sought after work-life balance has never been more pertinent as these two worlds collide. However, it's important to acknowledge that everyone is different and what I define as work-life balance may not apply to everyone. Yet one thing is for sure, the pandemic highlighted that it's important, regardless of your definition of work-life balance, to be able to be flexible and adapt to your changing needs and the demands of the environment. The pandemic also highlighted how important it is to be able to multitask, adopt new routines, and yet not cling to these routines too tightly. For example, if you have a young family that you care for, you may prefer to keep traditional work hours and keep evenings and weekends to spend with your family. However, there may be crunch times such as grant deadlines, student thesis reviews, and conferences when you have to adapt and accept you may need to spend some evenings and weekends working. As long as you understand that the routines don't need to be rigid, you could usually adapt and thrive. Now in the next few slides, I'll go over some lessons I learned from career development program I participated in at McGill and from reading and listening to other researchers experience as they face the challenge of maintaining an active research program 
while juggling working from home, having kids at home, and facing the conundrum of feeling we have no alone time while simultaneously feeling socially isolated. I will admit that it was not always easy, and there were days that my partner and I wondered, how long can we take this? But I hope the following lessons that I share and which helped me will also help you. So first and foremost, the thing I learned was to accept that you can't control everything. I don't know if this is true for every PhD, but I know for many, including myself, there's a need to control everything and to have some sense of certainty. This may be part of what makes us good scientists, this desire to design well-controlled experiments and get closer to the true understanding of how the natural world works. However, one thing the pandemic highlighted to everyone is that we have no control over everything, and definitely not over the virus, and that we must accept that life and at times our careers are full of uncertainties. And if we want to not be overwhelmed, we have to, and to be able to be functional, we have to come to terms with these uncertainties. Now, some of the things that have helped me come to terms with uncertainty and not being in full control during the pandemic was first to let go of my ideas of how things should be, especially comparing how things are now to how they were pre-pandemic. This just wasn't healthy. Um, and I also learned to be present and to really just accept my discomfort and upsetness about the current situation. And by accepting this, I could let it go and I could let go of the shoulds and I, it really helped me kind of be present and focus on what it is I can control. So one of the things that you have control over is yourself and what you choose to do and the behaviors that you choose that could help advance your career and also promote harmony in your personal lives. Once we accept our current situation and the uncertainties around it, it really can help us focus on choosing behaviors that prioritize our goals. Now we have many goals. We have multiple competing demands on our time from home and from work. So once we do let go and accept, how do we go about prioritizing what's important? One thing I learned in the course that I took at McGill was in order to prioritize effectively, I first needed to write down what my short and long-term goals were, both in my career and in my personal life. And then I had to answer the question, what are my values? What are the things that I believed in and that were important to the way I live and conduct myself at work? Now, your values at your career may differ from your values at home, that's okay. Before you prioritize your goals, you should first evaluate if your goals, both at your work and at home, align with your values. Because this really is a big predict predictor of long-term life satisfaction. So what are your short and long-term goals? Do they align with your values? And then use these values to guide your goals and prioritize the actions you need to achieve those goals. Another lesson that I learned that helped me during this pandemic in trying to achieve work-life balance was to be okay with satisfying. So it's okay to be pragmatic and not aim for an ideal solution in every domain. But I will say one thing, a one caveat that I found in deciding what to satisfy on is that it's important to decide to satisfy on items that are not too close to your immediate important goals or that cause you to deviate from your values. So for example, it's okay to reschedule your meeting with a trainee or clear some time in your calendar if you have a grant deadline. It's okay to say no to being on a committee if it will provide you with the time to continue an exciting new project that really will advance your research career. However, it may not be okay to let go of your healthy eating habits and your need for exercise for maintaining your inner mental health. So knowing what to satisfy on will depend on what your values are and what your immediate actions are to achieve your goals and really balancing all those three things. What are my values? What are my goals? And what do I have on my plate right now to achieve those goals? What is important and what is not and what can I satisfy on? 
Now, the final thing that I had to kind of learn and acquire throughout my career in academia that really has helped me be more productive and I think is essential to the productivity of any long-term academic is to learn how to rest, relax, enjoy, and rejuvenate. There is an article written in Nature by Dr. Virginia Gowen that went into how the pandemic has affected burnout in academia. And in that article, she highlighted some important things that kind of touch on the items that I already spoke on. First, not to internalize any the burnout as an internal failure. It's not something that is associated with yourself or a personality issue. It really is we're facing a lot of challenges and a lot of demands on our time, and we shouldn't internalize anything that goes wrong. And second, she highlighted how it's important to prioritize and normalize conversations about mental health, both in your personal life and perhaps, if appropriate, in your work environment as well. And then to fight isolation and to also create ways to detach from stress. So this goes back to making time to rest, relax, enjoy, and rejuvenate. It's really important to book time off for yourself and make fun a priority. Now, of course, I went through a few items that I hope will help you achieve some work-life balance and navigate academia during the pandemic. So accept you can't control everything and come to terms with uncertainty. Go deeper and align your goals with your values and allow your values to guide what your priority tasks are. Be okay with satisfying and being pragmatic, but use this wisely and find support and take time for yourself. So finding support is one of those unsaid things that isn't really written in any of the articles um, about how to avoid burnout, how to balance career and personal life during the pandemic in academia. However, it's like an unwritten thing that's so important. If you don't have support, find support. It really is a crucial part of what helps you achieve, I think, long-term academic success. You know, hopefully you're lucky enough, like me, to have a very supportive spouse and partner who, balance, who takes 50-50 um, role at home and have family members that you could call on to help you. Because I know that without my spouse and my extended family members and friends, I would not have been able to really balance work and life and be productive during the pandemic. So if you don't have support systems in your life right now, please do reach out to um, your friends, your family, or to professional to try and find a way to support yourself so you could achieve the best. And I hope you take some time to enjoy this journey. Thank you for your time. And thank you to my family and to all my friends and mentors and my lab who really helped support this kind of balanced work-life environment as well. Bye. So for those that just walked in a little bit late, or if you're wondering, um, Dr. Raja is here and she will be here for the live Q&A, um, but we're going to hold those questions until the end. Um, so if you have those questions, hold on to them. You can ask them in person or um, you can write in the app as well. Um, so the next talk is from Dr. Inger Mooburn. Um, she's a professor at uh, the University of Australia. Um, sorry, the Australian National University, my apologies. Um, and she's the Director of Research Development um, and Office of the Dean of Higher Degree by Research. She's also known as the Thesis Whisperer and has some really, really um, great resources online that she'll speak about um, to translate skills from your PhD, but this also applies to any graduate studies or um, even um, research work that you do, how you can translate that to different um, parts of the workforce. So with that, we can play Dr. Mooburn's recording. Hi, I'm Inga Mooburn, better known on the internet as Thesis Whisperer. I'm a professor at the Australian National University here in beautiful Canberra, Australia. I'm speaking to you from the stolen land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders and custodians and acknowledge their tireless work looking after country and culture. 
Australians are famously plain speaking, so let me be blunt. If you're doing or have recently done a PhD, you're probably wondering what was the point. You knew it was competitive to get into academia, but now that dream has gone from feeling very hard to feeling impossible. On Twitter last year, someone, I forget who, said that getting an academic job in the 1990s was like winning a bingo competition at the local pub. They compared getting a job in 2010 to winning a prize doing a scratchy lottery ticket. But nowadays, getting an academic job feels more like winning $3 million at Powerball. In Australia, academia stopped being able to absorb all its graduates around 1996. That was nearly 30 years ago. People have started to vote with their feet. Enrolments by citizens, who can do the degree for free here, I might add, have failed to keep pace with population growth over the last 20 years. And yet, the idea of the PhD is kind of amazing. Time, material, space, expert advice to explore the unknown. A chance to work on the huge problems that have no easy solutions. The problems no one else will pay you to solve. And universities are great places to do PhDs. Most offer a multitude of resources, libraries, labs, studios, and there are all kinds of support staff to help you. Every campus is an abundance of knowledge loot, and you have almost unlimited access to it. While the potential of the PhD is huge, the problem is our academics tend to fill your time with expectations based on an academia of the past. We encourage you to publish in journals that only other academics read, reinforcing a norm that no one else's opinion really matters. We make opportunities for you to jet around the world and take part in conferences, but only invite other academics. We encourage you to form academic capital, knowledge that helps you play the publication game, for instance, at the expense of technical skills that will translate directly to a secure job outside academia, where no one cares how many papers you published. For almost a decade now, my own research has focused on the problem of post-PhD employability, specifically the problem of matching PhD graduates with secure, paid work that they will find meaningful and where their talents can be leveraged. I started this work in 2013 with my friend Rachel Pitt, looking at academic job ads. A job ad is like a wish list for a person that probably doesn't exist. But in job ads, employers describe the kind of work they want done and the sort of person they think can do this work. Our analysis of academic job ads showed that publications were not the main game when it comes to academic appointments. Universities are looking for people who can work in teams, organise and execute complex teaching plans in uncertain environments, and build networks with industries and other stakeholders. Oh, they definitely want you to publish too, but if you spend all your time doing that during your PhD, you will not be truly competitive for most academic jobs, beyond perhaps narrowly defined postdoc projects. If you want to go on to be a professor like me, nowadays you need to be a manager, a teacher, a fundraiser and a PR expert on top of being a researcher. Ironically, we've found that non-academic research jobs ask for much less. But before we could study non-academic jobs, we had to find them first. We did this using machine learning natural language processing techniques that can read large data sets of job ads, numbering in the millions, and sort them by research skills intensity. By doing this, we found that 80% of the employers who are looking for a researcher do not put the term PhD in their job ad. This means if you search in a conventional job search engine, you will only really see academic jobs. And this can give you the misleading impression that no one wants your research skills outside the academy. There is a job market for researchers in industry and government, but it is largely hidden. And our algorithm called POSTAC makes it visible. The algorithm can rank jobs on a scale of 1 to 10, what we call a nerdiness index. Then we take the nerdiest jobs and put them on the post search platform so that people can see all their options. You can access it at www.postac.com.au. You can see a demo there, but you won't be able to access all the features. Technology like Postac helps you make choices about what to focus on while you're doing your PhD. By looking at these job ads, we identify the key skills employers want. They include things like collaboration, planning, project management. Actually, the list doesn't look that different to the list we generated for academic jobs, with the exception of teaching. But I want to caution you that a skill developed in one place may not translate well to another. Project management is a good example. Project managing a PhD involves exploring and responding to what you find when you do an experiment or an interview, or perhaps look in an archive. This means that the process of planning must be continuous and reactive. Academic research is the search for truth, however that's defined. 
By contrast, many projects in industry have defined outcomes and targets. Instead of a pursuit of truth, an industry project may be more about finding good enough for now. Being a good project manager in industry means being able to work quickly and perhaps stop before the options have been exhausted. I think you can see where there's a potential culture clash moving from academia to industry, and I don't want to gloss over these problems, but nor do I want to leave you with the impression that research work outside of the academy can't be interesting and fulfilling. It certainly can. And given the ratio of academic jobs to non-academic jobs is about 1 to 12, there's a wide range of possibilities out there for you. But you will not make the best use of these possibilities without, well, rebelling a little bit. I see PhD students routinely discouraged from doing things that might help their career, like participating in public speaking competitions, blogging, making podcasts, documentaries, developing commercial ideas, or even teaching. And this discouragement happens in two ways. Explicitly, by telling you a non-academic activity is a waste of time, or interfering with your ability to spend time on professional development. And secondly, by modelling only one way to be an academic, one that writes academic papers, attends academic conferences, and so on. It's this second form of behaviour, modelling, that's more insidious and powerful. Now, many of my academic colleagues are well aware of the need for their students to develop a wide range of skills. They know that over 50% of PhD students won't get an academic job, and in some disciplines that percentage is even higher. Some academics really try to help their PhD students become well-rounded professionals. Good supervisors tell me they actively encourage their students to do things like the three-minute thesis or blog, and at the same time, these well-meaning academics would never do anything like blogging and public outreach. And you can't blame them, really. They know they'll get pushback for not writing papers that push their universities up the league tables. They have to publish to be in the running for grants. We are all victims of this system. And you're smart. You're going to look around you and copy the models of success. But this system also makes it hard for you to start spending your time on developing your full professional self. One of the most ritualistic parts of the PhD is the dissertation. It's an enormous time sink and I deeply question the point of the whole exercise. And no, I don't think a PhD by publication is any better. It only multiplies the difficulty by including peer reviewers and clogged journal publishing pipelines into the mix. Academic writing as a genre is ritualised, peculiar, archaic and does almost as much to hide knowledge as it does to share it. Everyone knows you can be a great researcher, creative thinker and innovator and struggle to finish a PhD because you're a bad academic writer. And here's the kicker. Most working academics dislike writing in the correct academic style and very few, if any people, genuinely enjoy reading it. I've spent a career helping people deal with the angst academic writing creates. I feel a bit conflicted about my role in it. It takes a long time to master the in-group signalling that characterises academic writing. Maybe experiencing this pain is the point. The dissertation creates a deliberately high bar to entry to the status of doctor. And it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the dissertation is more of a hazing ritual than a learning experience. Research students with an ambition to become employable inside and outside the academy should be writing a wide variety of things. Publicly accessible reports on the implication of your research, blog posts, opinion pieces, memos to policymakers, web copy, teaching notes, instructional texts, video scripts and more. PhD graduates should write to influence the communities they live in, as well as other academics. And if we accept this premise, we need to stop being so snobby and dismissive about other forms of writing especially if it's the best way to bring public attention to our research work. Because our research can change the world, but more people read books by the paleo-crazy Pete Evans, look him up, than actual health academics. The facts that people need to counter conspiracy theories are behind paywalls, while the damaging lies are out there for free on wellness blogs. Many PhD students continue to copy their mentors, shaping their behaviour to a future academic career to their own detriment. It can be heartbreaking to watch. It's even more heartbreaking to counsel PhD graduates who are 6 to 12 months past graduation with no real job prospects. That's when the fog tends to lift and a lot of people realise how much valuable time they wasted investing in markers of academic success that have no utility outside academia. I don't want you to be crying six months after graduation. I do want to help you make the most of this PhD opportunity. And the first step is to start consciously approaching your PhD like you won't be an academic and push back against these expectations. Everything is disrupted now. 
really disrupted. Not just, hey, it might be cool to replace taxis with Ubers kind of disrupted. You could spend this time developing old forms of academic capital, like how to navigate the journal peer review process. But here's my hot take as an expert on post-PhD employability. More academic capital won't translate to job security when there is very little job security available. Universities who shed full-time academic staff during the pandemic are now hiring those positions back. But where there used to be a professor, there is now a junior academic with a one-year appointment. What little secure work is available will cause hyper-competitive behaviour. In fact, there are many experienced academics now out of work and on that job market too, and you're competing with the big guns, not just your peers. Some of you might back yourself to win this race through hard. Some of you will back yourself to win this race through hard work and smarts, and that's great. I'm glad you have belief in yourself, and I have faith in you too. But I ask you to consider what cost will you pay? What will happen to you emotionally, socially, spiritually? What about your health? Is a tenuous job in academia really worth all that effort? Why not spend the effort and become the best researcher slash problem solver slash value creator you can be? And I don't mean value creator in an icky Silicon Valley kind of way. I mean someone who does things that people will pay for. Remembering that only academia will pay you to do journal papers. So do all the extras, seek the outside projects, learn to program in R or something similar, talk to communities and industry about what's important, maybe take on a paid internship. But here's the thing that no one really says out loud. You can only pass or fail a PhD. You don't get extra credit for doing a better job. And I'm not recommending you do a bad job. I just ask you to think differently about it. What is the minimum viable PhD? What does that look like? Instead of a 100,000 word thesis, you might plan out a juicy enough 65,000 word one or even less. Use the rest of the time to take advantage of the opportunities around you. If you're not going to be an academic, doing lots of journal papers is a monumental waste of time and effort. Keep up the teaching though, lots of great communication and organisational skills there. Certainly stop only turning up to classes to teach you how to write journal articles. Don't keep putting that marker of academic success ahead of other kinds of learning. That last bit will probably get me in trouble with some colleagues who directly benefit from your willingness to write journal articles with their name on it too. It's not a coincidence you feel pressure to write when it's their CV that you're building and not your own. I'm also calling bullshit on the massive corporate journal publishers, a recklessly profiteering industry that's sucking the lifeblood out of all of us and blocking access to knowledge in developing countries and sending our libraries broke. But I digress. Look, it's hard to go against the norms of academic behaviour, but personally, I've always found it more rewarding. What kinds of things would you write? What objects would you make if you didn't have an imaginary future academic career path ahead of you? Instead of a journal article, could you be writing a public report to influence policy? Could you be making a podcast, being interviewed on the news, writing a blog, making a YouTube video or TikTok, crafting a doc documentary script or something else? I'd back you to do something amazing. I want you to think of yourself as a freelance expert gun for hire and ask yourself, what problems can I solve and who will pay me to do it? I hope that I have Postac UK up soon so you can more easily access this larger hidden job market. But in the meantime, I urge you to draw upon the university resources and expertise and create the kind of PhD experience that you want. Be the change you want to see. Lots of food for thought there. Um, so Dr. Inger Moverin is not with us today. It is a big journey from Australia, but um, we actually want to write a blog post with her following her tips. So if you have questions and if you write them down in the chat that this is directed towards Dr. Moverin, um, or you can email us um, or, or um, tweet or message us over Twitter at OHBM underscore trainees, um, we will try and get some of your questions answered by her. Um, yes. Awesome. So this leads us to our third talk of the day from Mr. Victor Ikuda. Um, he had quite the journey coming over here from San Diego, so we're super happy that he's here. Um, and he will be speaking about um, improving diversity and equity in our STEM research and actual um, things that we can consider um, as we move our research projects forward. So. Um, and also, I should mention, he is an um, MD candidate, so he has, and kind of does research on the side, so it's, it's really incredible. Um, please come up on up here. Thank you so much.
All right, thank you very much for that introduction. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm um, excited this morning to present my talk uh, towards equitable brain science and brain health. Sorry for that, having some technical <laughs> difficulty. Oh, good. It should be this one, no? Uh, which button is it to, to see the first slide? Oh, oh okay. never mind. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so for my talk today, I want to start off by discussing the concept that time is brain and the importance that timely intervention can play in preserving overall brain health. From there, I want to talk about the fact that there have been challenges uh, in the timely intervention in brain health for racial and ethnic minorities by highlighting two studies that show delays in the diagnosis of uh, dementia in these populations. And then finally, I want to conclude the talk uh, by discussing some potential solutions for addressing uh, brain health inequities. And so I would like to start off this talk uh, with a quote. Um, this quote comes from Dr. Camilo Gomez, um, a neurologist, uh, 1983, and the quote says, unquestionably, the longer therapy is delayed, the lesser the chance that it will be successful, and early intervention will probably be a major determining factor in the limitation of the damage of neurons located in the ischemic penumbra. Simply stated, time is brain. And this idea that time is brain is something that has become a fundamental rule uh, of stroke care for the last 25 years. And it's one thing to talk about the idea of time uh, being brain qualitatively, but is there any way for us to quantify that? And fortunately, there's been some recent advances in uh, functional neuroimaging that allow us to do just that. And this table that you see here comes from a 2006 study by Dr. Jeff Jeffrey Saver attempting to um, quantify the amount of brain tissue lost each, each time there's an ischemic stroke. And what you can see is that for um, every stroke, the brain loses 1.2 billion neurons or accelerates approximately 36 years. For every minute that a stroke goes untreated, uh, brain loses 1.9 million neurons. And similarly, uh, for every hour that ischemic stroke goes untreated, the brain loses almost as many neurons as it does in 3.6 years of aging. So all of that to say um, that time really is brain. And even though I'm beginning my talk um, with discussion that time is brain, sort of originated with stroke care, uh, I'd like to emphasize that this is a concept that applies uh, widely beyond stroke. So many diseases, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, schizophrenia, are all conditions where timely intervention and detection play an important role. Um, but for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to narrowly focus on Alzheimer's disease. And one of the reasons I want to focus on Alzheimer's disease uh, is the fact that we know that in Alzheimer's disease, neurodegeneration starts long before symptoms develop. So if you look at this plot um, at the top, on the y-axis you can see um, biomarker abnormalities uh, related to Alzheimer's disease, and on the x-axis you can see uh, time. And what you see is that as time goes on, uh, abnormalities in the biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease accumulate in a fairly sequential and predictable uh, fashion. Similarly, in this plot uh, at the bottom, you have cognitive function uh, on the y-axis and time again on the x-axis. And what you see uh, is two things. One, um, Alzheimer's disease neuropathology is present, even the absence of clinical symptoms. And then two, that as time goes on, um, and neuro, uh, Alzheimer's disease pathology um, begins to sort of progress, you can see impairments uh, both in cognitive, uh, cognitive uh, function as well as uh, function as well. And it's important to highlight here that Alzheimer's disease and other dimension, dementias don't impact all populations equally. In fact, Research has shown that African Americans and Hispanics have higher rates of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, uh, with African Americans two times more likely and Hispanics 1.5 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, uh, respectively. And despite this sort of uh, knowledge and awareness, 
there have been significant uh, recent research shows that there's challenges in the timely intervention um, for brain health for these racial and ethnic minorities. And so I want to go on to highlight two studies that support that. And so this first study um, out of JAMA Neurology was a study conducted by Soy et al. And in this study, what they did was to analyze the relationship between race uh, and ethnicity and the timeliness and comprehensive, comprehensiveness of dementia diagnoses using claims filed by 10,472 California Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. And to try to analyze the timeliness of dementia diagnosis, what they did was look at instances where individuals should have received um, an initial diagnosis of dementia, but were instead receiving an initial diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. And what they found, um, I don't know how well you can see this, but was that compared to uh, white uh, beneficiaries, um, individuals that were Asian, uh, black, and Hispanic were less likely to receive um, a timely diagnosis. In addition, when they looked at the number of recommended services received, they found specifically that for um, Asians, they were less likely to receive a comprehensive dementia diagnosis. For example, things like uh, certain neuroimaging or specialist referrals um, were less likely in this population. The second study I want to highlight, uh, also out of JAMA Neurology, was a study conducted by Powers et al that essentially showed that trends um, in dementia risk disparities have remained stagnant over time. And so what they did was to look at the rates of dementia for uh, black Americans um, between the years 2000 and, two, and 2016, um, as well as the rate of dementia for the overall US population. And they found that the rates of dementia uh, for black Americans remained disproportionately high within this period um, while the rate for, of dementia for the U.S. population remained relatively stable or declined. Perhaps more troubling is that the investigators found um, no evidence that the relative black-white disparities in the incidence or prevalence um, were decreasing during this same period. And so taken together, this kind of gives a pretty troubling picture, which is that you have um, minority populations who are disproportionately at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease Yet these same groups are also uh, less likely to receive a timely diagnosis, a trend that does not seem to be improving uh, at all. And so that brings us to the fact that there's a really pressing need uh, for solutions. And right now we're at a point where we still have a window of opportunity for change, and so we have a choice. We can either uh, take action or we can uh, sit idle as the brain health of these vulnerable communities continues to deteriorate. And so what are, kind of solutions are there? What kind of actions can we take? Um, the first is a focus on recruiting diverse populations in health research. So today, much of what we know about Alzheimer's disease comes from non-Hispanic, highly educated, urban dwelling uh, white individuals. Um, yet, uh, even today, our, population is changing widely. So this plot here is showing uh, individuals over the age of 65 and showing the proportion um, that are white in light green and that are not white in uh, dark green. And what you can see is that it's projected as we go from 2020 to 2060 that the proportion of population that's age 65 or older, these individuals are at highest risk for Alzheimer's disease, uh, the proportion of that that is minority is continuing to increase. So there's a more pressing need to have um, a diverse population in health research that better reflects this population. And so how exactly do we do this? What kind of strategies can we use? Um, the first is establishing a collaborative and mutually beneficial relationship between our communities and the research uh, team. So it's important um, fundamentally to try to build uh, trust um, between minority communities and health researchers. Uh, secondly, it's important to employ team members who ex have extensive ties to the community and who reflect the individuals in that community. So if you're trying to recruit more, let's say, African Americans into um, your research study, um, it's helpful to, of course, have individuals on your team 
that are either African American or at least have ties to, that, to the community where you're trying to recruit these individuals. And then a third strategy is also working to identify key contacts uh, within the community um, for networking purposes and that can serve as stakeholders that help you to build trust. Um, an example within the African American community is you know, maybe partnering with black fraternities or black sororities or barbershops. Um, these are entities within the community that have already established some level of trust and so working with them uh, helps you to have a little bit more credibility if you wanna recruit from populations, um, re recruit from members of these communities. And what does that look like in real life? Um, so this is a new initiative called the Black Men's Brain Health Emerging Scholars Program. Um, it's an initiative um, I'm part of as well that essentially trains researchers on how they can conduct um, brain, health research or brain health research in black men. As part of the program, we also have to take action in that we have to recruit at least 10 um, black males into a black men's brain health research registry. And you can imagine how you could similarly apply something like this to other groups. Um, the second solution I propose is thinking about how we can increase representation in STEM more broadly. Um, studies have shown that when you look at college um, age students, um, African Americans and Hispanics actually enter college having similar interest in science uh, to Caucasians. However, by the time you get to graduation, um, the dropout rate in these communities for uh, STEM fields has drastically increased. And so what can we do to kind of combat this? One is STEM outreach programs, programs that can give um, students early exposure to science is a good way to um, get more you know, individuals interested in, in science and research into the pipeline. And then secondly, um, mentorship programs. So oftentimes there's an emphasis on recruiting more um, minority populations into STEM programs, but uh, there's not as much of an emphasis on keeping them there, right? It's one thing to bring someone to the table, um, but you still have to give them food when, when they're there. And so one way of doing that is having mentorship programs that can uh, support um, students and keep them interested in science. Also different programs that empower uh, members of these communities and also give them early exposure to research. So what does that look like in the real world? Um, this is just an example of a program I've been fortunate to be part of um, through the MIT Office of Engineering Outreach Programs. And this is a program uh, that's seeking to diversify uh, STEM. And so 70% of our students uh, come from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Of our students, 70 to 80% are members of underrepresented minority groups. And individuals who pass our program go on to attend some of the most selective universities uh, in the country. And as part of this program, um, I was fortunate to teach a course related to Alzheimer's disease and innovation. And so every week the students would come in, they would learn some uh, topic about Alzheimer's disease and then have a chance to practice developing solutions uh, through sort of a hackathon type format. And this is just an example, again, of how we can um, diversify the field. Third solution, um, which I think goes hand in hand with solution two, is educating underserved communities on brain health. This is important for many reasons uh, but one, you can see um, a statistic that comes from the Alzheimer's Disease Association, which uh, found, they found a survey that 55% of uh, African Americans, um, older African Americans thought that significant loss of cognitive abilities and memory was a natural part of aging. So for some uh, members of minority communities, there's a belief that, you know, any loss of uh, cognitive abilities is not actually, you know, part of a disease, right? And that, that can affect um, getting access to certain treatments, that can affect uh, taking early steps for intervention. And so coming up with culturally sensitive community education that can empower members of these communities, that provides not only factual knowledge um, about disease such as Alzheimer's, but also gives them uh, actionable steps that they can take, such as high, healthy lifestyle recommendations um, to improve their overall brain health and, and wellness. And so what does this look like in the community? So this is a, uh, what I always thought was a pretty cool program called Hip Hop Stroke. And essentially um, was a collaboration with 
a neurologist at Columbia and a rapper, uh, Dougie Fresh, and they came up with an interactive module to teach fourth and fifth graders uh, about stroke, to be able to identify what a stroke is, how it occurs in the body, and how to recognize the symptoms and what to do when someone's having a stroke. So I have a video here. I don't know if it will um, get that to play. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Can we get the video? Okay, so hopefully if you were asleep, you're awake now. Um, but more importantly, um, they've actually done studies on the effectiveness of this program and found that um, it increased uh, the knowledge of stroke for these fourth and fifth graders and also that knowledge, um, that increase in knowledge lasted up to 15 months. So it really is a program that, you know, programs like this that can actually have some type of impact. Um, the fourth solution is trying to conduct research to address structural and systemic root causes of these disparities. Um, so one of the things we know is that um, someone's life experience or the life course is something that can impact their brain health. And what are some of the factors that are involved in life experience that can do that? Well, at the top, I've listed some of these factors, um, often known as the social determinants of health, things like someone's you know, economic stability. Do they have a job? Can they pay their bills? Uh, what type of neighborhood do they live in? Is it safe? Can they exercise? Um, are they able to have easy access to food or do they live in a food desert? All of these types of factors are things that can ultimately affect somebody's um, overall brain health. And I'd also like to highlight that many of these factors are themselves linked ultimately to racism. And so it's important in thinking about um, research to start to look at how these um, race-specific uh, factors can get under someone's skin to affect their overall brain health. And by doing that, we can get a better insight into um, some of the mechanisms that might underlie health disparities and maybe even come up with potential solutions for how people can lower the risk of getting um, dementia. And then my last solution I propose is training clinicians and researchers on how they can better meet the needs of vulnerable communities. And so if you're sitting in the audience here today, you're already doing one of those things, which is just becoming aware um, of the disproportionate, disproportionate uh, effect that dementia has in underrepresented and diverse communities, and some of the biases that are present um, in the medical establishment, the diagnosis and care of these underserved individuals. And then moving from just awareness to how we can take action, um, as researchers, Investigate, investigating ways um, that healthcare professionals can inform people about the results of Alzheimer's disease in a more timely and culturally sensitive manner. The way that we talk about this, these conditions um, in different populations are not necessarily, not necessarily the same and they don't necessarily want to hear about it the same way. And then finally, um, looking into more appropriate or effective biomarkers and treatments that we can use. And so on this slide, just to sort of highlight that further, there's been studies of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers um, in black or African-American individuals compared to white individuals. And what you see is that, um, first of all, there have been very few studies that have been performed in these populations. But more importantly, the results of these studies um, have been mixed. So there's an open question here about what biomarkers um, you know, may work for these um, populations or not. And so we really need larger studies with more representative samples from these, uh, from these groups. And also, like I alluded to earlier, thinking about social determinants of health, looking at how maybe some of those factors might Im impact these biomarkers. And so to summarize, um, as we discussed earlier, time is brain. And as a result of that, um, timely intervention in stroke and other brain conditions 
is something that can be very important to preserving overall brain health. There's research, however, that suggests that there's disparities in the timely diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in minority populations. Um, but right now we have a window of opportunity where we can um, intervene in a timely fashion to stop any further damage to the brain health of these uh, valuable communities. And with that, it concludes my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Caroline, for inviting me. I thought that was you there. Amazing. Um, so that is um, that concludes the content um, of our session. But uh, we do have a good amount of time for Q and A. Um, so we have Dr. Raja here and uh, Mr. Ikuda. And as I mentioned, um, unfortunately, Dr. Moover could not be here. I can see that there was already a question in the app. So we will be sure to relay that to her. Um, but feel free to come up and ask questions. Um, if you'd like, um, but while we're waiting for people, um, I thought maybe I would start with one. So, um, and I know that there are three kind of independent um, topics, but um, just thinking about work-life balance as well as um, really making sure we're reaching um, minorities as well and other groups that might be disproportionately impacted, for instance, by the pandemic. So we do know that the pandemic disproportionately impacted some groups. Um, are you aware of like, because you highlighted some um, like programs or, or um, resources in the US, but um, is there any advice that you would give particularly for those that are in underrepresented minorities that maybe went through some additional struggles through the pandemic um, of how they could maintain their work-life balance or any um, support groups that you know of um, linked to that? Which, who, uh, both of you, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm not aware of any of that research. I thought you were directing that question to him. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. even not even research, but just um, if there's any advice that you could give to um, those that maybe struggled disproportionately during the pandemic. Maybe they weren't um, confident enough to bring up their um, uh, like their concerns throughout the pandemic. Um, just kind of creating more of that. Um, inclusive environment for them? Um, I really think reaching out to community members is an important way to um, find balance and get the care you need. Um, it might not be within your academic community. There might be members um, that you know of. If not, you always have program directors and your, um, your, your committee at large that you could reach out to. In addition, reaching out to your friends and family, I think um, finding that uh, environment that you feel safe in is very important. Um, and sometimes that is through your, like there's cultural groups and then there's sometimes um, community groups that you could do outreach with and reach out to to get that support. So it's really important. I know there's a burden to do some research and some finding of your own when you're uh, from those kind of populations, but I really think that um, taking that effort and reaching out for uh, that kind of care in your community might make it easier um, and feel, help you feel more comfortable in getting the care you need. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, we do have a question for Victor. Um, what kind of strategies can we take as researchers in our work to help bridge some of the mistrust or stigma that sometimes exists around research and medicine in some communities? Sure, um, that's a really great question. Um, I think uh, the big thing is, is trying to build trust um, with these communities, um, even before doing the research. So sometimes people are like, okay, I wanna have more you know, African-American people in my research. I'm just gonna go onto the community, tell them I need you know, more African-Americans in my research or this is important for them and that's gonna get them to come to do the study. Um, that's typically not gonna work. I think you have to build um, trust through relationships, establishing yourself in the community, um, having, like I mentioned, having community partners, people that may already be in the community that have some level of credibility. Um, these are things that will help to sort of bridge um, some of that mistrust and, and, the, and, the, and the fear that maybe, oh, you're coming here just to do this research or to exploit this community and you're not gonna give anything back. I think that's, um, it's important to show that 
um, sort of a quote that I heard that is that you know, people want to know um, that you care before they care um, you know, what you know. And so really showing that you care about these communities beyond just like, I want to do my research or get this paper or whatever is, is important for building trust. Yeah, and that kind of uh, touches upon some of like Dr. Muburn's, Muburn's points about, you know, we're kind of laser focused on like publications and papers and all that. How, I mean, this is obviously a very broad question, but how do we try and step away from that like kind of culture of like, oh, we still need to publish and it's easier just to get this sample um, because it's readily available. Um, and you know, grants, they're, they're on a, we get funding for a certain number of years. So we're under pressure to just like, Sometimes, um, you know, okay, we'll just control for race or ethnicity and whoever we have, we have. How do we um, try and maybe um, like work with either funding agencies or something like that to ensure that we have the time to do like quality research? Um, definitely, I know it's a big kind of broad question, but this is how I think sometimes. <laughs> so can I? So I, I'm interested in this kind of work and I do a lot of, um, at least I attempt to increase the diversity of my sample in the research that I do in healthy aging. Um, and one of the things that I think really works is, you know, you have a goal and you work with those communities and you recruit members into your team from those communities that are welcome and trusted um, to do that kind of work. And you have that goal in mind and when you do publish, if you don't have the sample size to do the analysis of, of, of a research question of interest when it comes to ethnic or social disparities, um, it really is at least important that you report it in your demographic table. So just be transparent in who your sample is and get that information out there. Um, I, I kind of would suggest not to do the analysis till you're well powered in some ways because this is a very sensitive area of research and any sort of information is uh, digested by the public very quickly. And so you have to be very responsible in doing the kind of work. And if it is unpowered, you shouldn't be reporting it or at least put it as um, secondary analysis and note uh, the limitations of the analysis and note that it's underpowered. But you should definitely be transparent in reporting who is in your sample to the best of your ability. Thank you. There was a question there, yes. Um, yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much for your talks. Um, I had a question about uh, existing di disparities when recruiting participants. So I noticed in my research that it's sometimes uh, more difficult to recruit uh, people from minority populations, especially when we're talking about uh, vulnerable people. So with, for example, in my research, I recruit people with psychiatric conditions. Um, and that is because of existing disparities. So these people may, uh, it may be difficult for them to invest the time and the energy in participating in research because they're unable to miss a day at work or they have um, to care for family members. So do you have any thoughts about that and how we would be able to uh, include them in research or support them in some way that um, they'll be less, uh, more likely to participate? Um, I think that, that's a really great question and, and it very much highlights some of the challenges of doing uh, research with minority populations. Um, I think one potential strategy is thinking of how you can maybe bring the research to, you know, this won't work for all studies, but bring the research to your uh, participant, whether that's, you know, if there's certain samples you need to collect and that's something that you can do um, you know, in closer proximity to them or to, to, to avoid them having to travel, um, that's one uh, potential solution thinking about um, how you give incentives for doing the research throughout the study, not just, okay, if you do, you know, do this study and complete it, you'll get your, your payment at the end. Like, like you mentioned, these people have ongoing concerns, like feeding their family, getting to work, and so maybe instead of giving that all at the end, you can distribute that throughout the study in, in some way. I think these are some potential um, solutions you could, you could think about. So can I also, um, one piece of advice is to look at your criteria for inclusion. So sometimes you might be thinking you're just doing this basic neuropsych, they have to meet this inclusion to get into the study, but that, those neuropsychs are biased, uh, the cutoffs are biased, um, so you have to be mindful and sometimes it's worth dropping 
the inclusion criteria um, if you want to aim to include some samples that are very hard to recruit. Um, and then, yeah, I think you really have to build those relationships with the communities in order to gain that trust for them to give up. It is a lot to ask for participants to come in and give that time for research. So you have to you know, do a really good convin uh, convincing of that community that it's worth uh, their time and their effort and then try and be flexible in what resources you provide for them and also make it uh, maybe the testing times more flexible so you work around their availability and you go to their community and you do the testing there. That's a really good point. Sometimes we just kind of like copy paste methods blindly, like this is the exclusion inclusion criteria and a lot of them haven't changed for so many years but it's based on a particular population. So that's, yeah, I'm, that's a really great consideration. Okay, we have a lot of questions in the chat so I'm trying to think of what to prioritize. Um, this is actually something I was thinking because I, I know sometimes it can be tricky for mentees to speak up about this. Um, how would you recommend uh, mentees initiate a conversation with their mentors if they think they're working too long hours um, or how can they kind of manage their work-life balance and initiate that conversation, um, especially now? <laughs> That's a very hard conversation to have, but I hope, I hope for many of you, you have a good relationship with your mentor. So they, you know, you, you have a, a personal, professional relationship where you can talk to your mentor. Now, when you have a mentor that's not as approachable or you're intimidated, um, you know, we are, you know, we're mentors, we're human too. So if you approach them without, a, without the defensiveness or the expectations, that they're going to push back and you kind of explain your situation and contextualize it, most mentors will, are human, <laughs> and will understand and will um, accommodate. However, there are exceptions always and sometimes uh, people only know the realities through which they lived and the expectations that were placed on them and they think that's the norm um, and have a hard time seeing beyond that. And in that case, I think you do have committee members, right? So. Your men, you, sh you should have a committee around you, not just your mentor to reach out to. Um, and you should have a GPD, a chair, that you should be able to reach out to. And sometimes, depending on the university, you might have a graduate union that you could reach out to as well if things get to the level that you need to do that. But I really recommend first trying to contextualize the issue and like not be defensive and have approach your mentor and see how that goes and if that doesn't work for you reach out to your committee like don't take it right to the top right away but try and build and work around and hopefully they can meet you halfway with when they have like a committee member coming in and talking with you with them to explain the situation a bit more broadly but often it's a lack of context and um, you know perceived defensiveness or blame that causes those kind of conversations to go awry. Yeah, I think it's really important to remember we have that network around us and it's, it's a difficult conversation as you said, but um, if it's important for your health, take that step for sure. Um, I, I know Victor, you didn't speak about work-life balance per se, but I did want to get your perspective, especially as someone in med school um, and doing research, um, what has helped you to kind of maintain that work-life balance? And I think that might be helpful for anyone who is considering or has considered even for a hot minute med school. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, one is just uh, blocking out portions of time. When I say I'm going to you know, do a specific task, that always helps. Otherwise, I end up you know, procrastinating. Um, the other is that I, that I personally found helpful work-life balance is if there's something fun I want to do, I just go ahead and do it and make the work sort of work after. I know that sounds weird, but it, it's very easy to get into this mindset that, oh, I'm going to have this block of time. It's like, oh, I'll wait until I have this block of time. And there's always something, some new grant to write or some paper to publish or something to apply for. And you never have this sort of like block of time that you can pull out and be like, oh, now I can go do something fun. You kind of just have to... Um, if something is important to you, something that you want to do, um, go ahead and do it and sort of make the time work around that. Something I, I like that, fun first. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, we still have a few minutes left, let me see. Um, so this one's for either of you, um, and I know we've touched upon this, but um, do you have specific suggestions um, for how we can build relationships with 
um, uh, communities that are under-researched or underserved. Um, yeah, especially if you'd like to recruit from these those specific communities. Um, I would say um, just, just a good one, again, that, that, that I, I really advocate for is, is having like, community partners. You know, don't feel like you have to do all this, the legwork by yourself. So whether that's uh, people in the church or harvest shops or fraternities, so, so where these people on the grounds that can also help you um, establishing that, you know, you're not here to just take advantage of the community. I think that that's a very helpful way to build trust. It's also helpful if you, if there are newsletters, like I'm in Montreal, there's a lot of different communities they publish in their own language. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you can, you know, approach the, speak that language or at least have the print work done in that language um, for them to be able to read what you're asking, who you're looking for, things like that. Sometimes it's just feeling respected that you're approaching them through their language and through their community. Yeah, that's a really great one. And I've seen, um, for instance, like the SPSIG had organized um, a workshop in Mandarin. I know that you guys had highlighted also um, the Asian perspective. So yeah, bringing in also those cultural, um, making people feel more included. I think that's so important, amazing. Um, so this uh, next question is for Dr. Raja, but we can um, both answer it as well. Um, so uh, this is, particularly for people who are starting families. Um, the question was about women, but could be about men for sure. How can academia take into account the time women and men take aside when having kids while trying to get tenure? Um, let me see, that is a tough one. It, it varies by country. Yeah. And so that's why um, I want to, I only know the Canadian perspective, and Canada has been, has a, a great program for parental leave where you're allowed to take a year um, in academia and anywhere you're allowed to take a year, either the parents, and then you can extend it to two years. I know it's very different in America um, as far as parental leave. Um, you know, it's always a good time, and it's always good to prioritize, I think, your, your family, if that's, your, if that's in your value system, right? So is that your value for you? Um, if it's a value for you, I think it's, it's always a good time to have a family, and it's always a good time to take that time off. Um, I'm not sure about the legal uh, situation in America, so I have a hard time answering it for Americans, but in Canada, you know, move to Canada, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, in Canada, you have a year off, and I think it's, um, you know, the way, the way I did it, like it, it I was pre-tenure, um, and, I, and I got tenure during, like all, actually, I was pre-tenure when I was expecting, and then I got tenure during. Um, and so you just, you have that conversation. It's always, you know, these conversations are hard. You have these conversations and you, hopefully the person on the other side understands. And um, there is, you know, you explain that you're taking the time off. I don't think you approach it as you're, they're doing you a favor or anything like that. You, you, you say, this is my situation. This is what I'm going to do, you know. Um, this is my expectation, and this is what I expect when I come back as well. And you really have to um, s represent yourself. And if, it might be hard, so maybe talk to someone else that's gone through it within your institute to see how they approached it and have that conversation. But always, um, you know, this is not a favor anyone's doing for you, right? Don't approach it like, oh, I'm asking you permission or I'm asking for a favor. This is expected, and that's how you it's an expectation. You should walk in with the expectation that you're going to be supported. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. I agree with that. Um, so we have a minute left, so I'm going to ask just like a very broad question because it's re-envisioning the future of academic training, right? So, um, so where, what would you like to see um, in research, like a big kind of goal within five, ten years, and how can our future PIs in this room help us attain that? Um, but I think uh, for me, I, I just love to see that our research uh, population, the people we do research uh, in, and is more reflective of the overall population, and also the type of people that are doing research, uh, see more diversity there. Um, I think, you know, again, some of the strategies we talked about earlier, just of how we can try to recruit more 
um, diverse populations into our research is something that you all can do. We have a lot of brilliant people in this room, and so um, having you guys help help with that um, would be great. Oh, on my end, I would like to see um, more diversity, more equity, more access to resources throughout your career stages, and more uh, support from the systems uh, that we work within. Um, but I also think um, something that, like, I'm a neuroscientist and something that I'm learning later in my career, and I hope uh, I continue to learn and other people learn as well, is that, you know, the social environments in which you work really do affect brain health and the outcomes that we, you know, and the diseases that we're trying to help out with. So we shouldn't um, do neuroscience within a vacuum. We always should look at the context and consider the social determinants of health and how they play into all the research questions we ask. And if we ignore the social determinants of health, at least acknowledge that, um, that we are looking within uh, a very narrow scope in trying to answer a specific clinical or neuroscientific question. Thank you so much. With that, we are at time, but I think the speakers will hang around maybe for a few minutes if you have specific questions. Um, thank you so much again for supporting the SP6 events, for being here, um, and stick with it. I know it's been a hard past few years, but just the fact that we're here in person and encouraging each other um, and navigating this crazy academic world, um, it's, it's inspiring to all be together for this. So thank you so much. Have an awesome rest of your conference. Um, and yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for having us.